Yeah, I have a few questions, uh, and uh, thank you again for joining us uh, uh, this afternoon, Chief Patricia. Um, I guess just kind of like uh, I know you've been talking a bit of uh, you know title claims. I guess um, what would that mean, you know, to the Worcester Way communities and the people if uh, uh, if and when uh, you know that title claim is successful? Well, it's going to mean a great deal because right now. Um, there's a, there's a lot of crown land, um, unfortunately less crown land in Willistigway territory than there is in Mi'kmaq territory. But that particular crown land would become, we would become the landlords to that, as opposed to the province. And so when they found Aboriginal title uh, existed out um, in British Columbia with the Joe Coton um, decision in, in 2014, Basically, the bottom line was there was a, a, the Crown Forest Act was they were they were arguing saying no it doesn't apply here because we have Aboriginal title and they won that. Um, unfortunately, that that particular land is, is not the most valuable land, so it wasn't as contentious as as what might be coming down the pipes in the future in British Columbia. But the same would apply here. So if we if we prove that we are not that we are the original uh, title holders, then we uh, we be, in essence become the landlords. So the uh, crown, the Crown Lands and Forest Act wouldn't really apply there unless we decide what's going to happen. So this would leave up in the air a lot of um, concern to uh, large corporate leaseholders of Crown land, and we all know who I'm talking about here, uh, particularly in New Brunswick, and that would be very scary for them. And surprisingly, they're being quiet right now. Uh, the uh, the uh, Willisted Way have made it very clear that we have no interest in going after, um, you know, third party bona fide purchasers for like who purchased their land. Like, so if you have a piece of land in Fredericton, uh, you, you don't have to worry about that. You know, we're looking more at going after the crown land that's left and what's being leased under the, um, under the Crown Lands and Forest Act, as well as potential uh, large sales to these corporations. So uh, it's, it's gonna be a fight. It's a fight not only against the federal government, but the provincial government, but it'll soon be up against some of these larger uh, corporations. Thank you. I just have um, a question around land, land claims is, uh, what do you feel are, uh, some misconceptions around land claims. If you're talking about specific land claims or comprehensive land claims, well, comprehensive land claims is, um, that's a scary term because if you're sitting down negotiating with the federal government, they could be writing you down as a statistics. Oh, we're talking about stuff. So we're in a comprehensive land claim agree agreement and so um and that they are modern day treaties and so a lot of misconception i think i think in the atlantic is if if we are in comprehensive which i don't think anybody is uh, at least uh the willis way are not i can't speak for the other communities um that we would be making modern day treaties and then getting rid of our peace and friendship treaties and that's absolutely not true that's not anything that any one of us would want to do i'm sure um so and and then if you're talking more about specific land claims um a big misconception there is if when you because when we won the land claim it was pretty much for the whole of downtown edmonston well the people in the city kind they panicked they were like, oh my gosh, you know, are we on reserve? Are we gonna get kicked off? What does this mean? Like people truly believed that the uh, third parties were gonna be interrupted uh, or, or we, their land was gonna be taken. So they were quite scared. Um, luckily the mayor of the town, I had had many discussions with him and he made a public announcement and we did whatever we could to alleviate people's fears of losing their land that they bought in the province and that's you know that's by no means the intention of 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 our people right recognition is number one but also revenue sharing and not about going down and saying okay now that house is ours or we're going to tax you or anything like that so that's a big misconception i think 
Thank you. Um, I guess I just kind of started uh, touching a bit on uh, the peace and friendship. So I just uh, treaties. Uh, so I was just wondering, uh, you know, what uh, you know, what are you know the peace and friendship treaties um, to you and your organizations in the Wolastikway communities? Well, the peace and friendship treaties that we signed dating back to 1725. Um, and then the subsequent sort of ratifications of those uh, those treaties over time, those peace and friendship treaties were there to to do two things to to secure peace and and um, com commerce like that those are two major things so economic development is a part of our peace and friendship treaties it's it's there because it's meant we even like with the Marshall decision though those treaties guaranteed um, an Aboriginal person's right to earn a moderate livelihood which is economic development and commercial so um, these treaties are important to us for that particular reason it's a recognition of our nationhood standing it's a a recognition of the land that's that belongs to us the commerce the government everything so they they really are are are, are the baseline for the relationship that we have with the crown and they're extremely important and it's not just something you can just throw away i, I have a lot of uh, non non-native friends and they're like oh those treaties are hundreds of years old why don't you just get rid of them like times have changed i said you know the constitution of canada is over 150 years old too let's get rid of that and of course at what point is something so old right it doesn't make any sense these are these are important documents that formed our history and our evolution through through uh, through centuries of of uh, bad relationships that we've had to always proven that you know where we are um, so I, I do you have any other questions I see I think Allison has a question yeah I will uh We'll, uh, we'll pass it over to Allison to ask her question. Okay. I'm happy to wait. Um, I'm just so impressed. I Your love of history and the ability as a student to, to be inspired by this and carry it through throughout your profession, it really is inspiring. But I'm, I'm curious with all of the, the miscommunication around this success for your community, have you ever felt threatened when the government is trying to to remove you from this discussion or you know when the announcements made and the people in the the town are scared ha have you felt threatened um no I, i'm the youngest of seven children <laughs> uh and so I, i've learned to sort of deal with um bigger people than me trying to take over stuff and uh I know I'm not afraid at all. I've never felt threatened. Uh, the city, the city right now, there's, um, you know, there's, there's always going to be racism. There's systemic racism that exists, but we've done a lot to educate um, the city and the council, uh, and uh, and that's helped a lot. And so, at one point, we entered into a First Nation municipal um, agreement. So we have a friendship accord with the city. Mm -hmm. And we've had meetings. And in one of those meetings, um, it was an interesting exercise where they had the chief and council on one side, and then they had the mayor and all his council on the other. And we filled out like these questionnaires. And one of the questions that was asked to the chief and council was how well would you scale yourself on, of knowledge on one to 10 on how the city makes decisions? So, you know, we all went to school and we, you know, we learned a little bit about, you know, politics and stuff. So none of us were braggers or anything. So with that name, seven, maybe eight, maybe six around there. When the same question was asked of the mayor and all of his council, and they said, how well do you know how a First Nation government makes decisions? The highest number was three. Most people said zero, one, or three. I mean, it's really people don't know how things operate. So it's all about teaching, um, education, and and if you can get together, the more the more you can educate people, the better. And and that that particular exercise, working with the city and the city council, and, and worked quite a, a lot to 
uh, raise awareness because we're smack dab, our reserve is an urban community, smack dab in the middle of Edmonton. It's, they surround us and we're also on the international US border. So we have, <laughs> you know, we're, we're an urban community and, and at this point, our economic success has ma made people ask more questions. And, uh, and that has actually done a lot to uh, educate people, at least locally. I, um, I know the province doesn't scare me or threaten me at all, even though they're trying their hardest to, uh, you know, we're, apparently according to the province, we can't have super wealthy reserves. Forget that, that would be horrible. I mean, Irving, no problem. You go ahead and be super wealthy and then you take all your money and you take it out of the country, we don't care. But First Nations, oh my gosh, that can't happen. That would be horrible. So this is, and, and Madawaska really can't help but feel targeted by that because our communities in this province are not super wealthy. Madawaska made some success and he's poking at us and that's just, that's just typical. I, I'm in for the game. I, I tell him, yeah, let's come out and play. Put on your big boy pants and we'll battle this in court if we have to. I have a question, Chief Bernard. Um, <clears throat> I've been emailing or chatting with Stanley and he says, well, just when, when there's a moment, ask your question because <laughs> I don't have the, the, the question icon on my screen. Um, <clears throat> first of all, thank you for your uh, clarity on the, the definitions between specific and comprehensive land claims. I was always confused with those. So now you've made it very clear, so I appreciate that information. Uh, and you broached into the forestry sector when you mentioned uh, the BC decision in 2014 around forestry, and then you mentioned it about New Brunswick. I know there seems to be um, some undercurrents uh, in Ontario, because I also have First Nation communities that I work with in Ontario as well as New Brunswick. And um, <clears throat> I'm just kind of wondering if you're aware of any particular forestry related claims that have been successful in Ontario. Um, so, so treaty, treaty education is so complex that um, if you look, if you go back in time in history and, and when, when there was a lot of battle between the French and the English, and this is where the peace and friendship treaties really came out of. They were, the French and the English were really trying to, to, to get allies to prevent war. War was expensive. And when you're, you know, starting a new colony, you don't want to do that. So, so the peace and friendship treaties were there to, to, to help and protect the crown, as well as to provide um, a recognition to the First Nations. But as colonization starts to move west, somebody in their insight said, oh, well, wait a minute, we need to uh, make sure we have some treaties with these First Nations uh, going forward because we're not conquering them. And, um, and so what happened is, you end up with uh, a lot of what they called the numbered treaties and the land session treaties. And so Ontario is pretty much full of land session treaties where they, 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 did, um, they did in the treaties give up eight, millions of acres of land in exchange for uh, small reserves and benefits and maybe and treaty annuities, what they would call. And those treaty annuities, annuities still happen, which is, is crazy because these treaties that might have been signed in the 1800s promised $5 for every uh, Native person. And so INAC every year goes out and they gave out, they give out $5 like 100 years later. They're giving out $5 and it's a big deal. Like it's just so... Out in Ontario, the, the law is a little bit different from the Maritimes because we don't have land session treaties. The, the, our peace and friendship treaties never gave up the land. It only recognized our existence, our commerce, and, and that we would be good. Uh, we wouldn't be, um, we wouldn't molest their settlers and they wouldn't molest us, that type of thing. But then when you go out, we, they started the numbered treaties. And then when you get into the West, well, they just, they didn't do it. They stopped. So that's why when you go out to BC, you can get land title claims because they didn't cede their land. They didn't give it up. They didn't surrender it, but the other treaties did. So when it comes to forestry, there are, there are other, uh, mind you, there are other legal arguments to be made um, for consultation, uh, particularly with the duty to consult. So for if, if uh, Ontario has large um, uh, areas of, of forestry that are crown lands that First Nations can practice their Aboriginal and uh, treaty rights there because the treaties did give them the right to hunt and fish and stuff like that, then, uh, then 
you know, these types of forestry acts can't infringe upon that. They can't just wipe away those rights. They come first. And that, that's where the duty to consult comes in. So as far, unless there's some new legal argument that's going to be made, because I do know that some First Nations in the numbered treaty areas, and by numbered treaties, I'm saying the ones that did cede their land and give up their land. They're saying it wasn't clear. That wasn't what we meant when we signed those treaties. So that's a whole other um, legal field. So Deborah, I think I, I, I captured your question or I hope I did. <laughs> was it something- Oh, you did. Good? It was a little piece of graduation about the treaties from, from East to West. And that was a sense I was kind of having, but I didn't want to jump to that conclusion on my own. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't have the history and legal background that you do, so I was just kind of curious about that. Um, and uh, congratulations on your awards, by the way. And uh, I, I did meet you when I was uh, on uh, when I met with the Joanna last fall as we were okay. preparing for the economic le leakage studies for Jedi. Okay. Okay. Nice. Wonderful. Um, just one more question there, um, Chief. Um, Krista had in the chat box, um, I think you kind of touched on a little bit, but maybe you can elaborate a little bit more. Is it possible that the issue of tax revenue and the media spin is retaliatory to Indigenous title claim? Um, she feels that there's a campaign to taint public uh, opinion against our Indigenous communities. So, I mean, I guess this all comes down to, is this coincidence or not? Um, if you look at what happened, uh, about a year or so ago, uh, we got a letter from the carbon tax. So, so our tax agreements say that all mode of fuel collected uh, taxes collected on reserve will be reimbursed. So then, of course, the carbon tax gets created. And then they're saying, well, no, 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 the carbon tax isn't part of mode of fuel. So we're going to stop giving you that money. And so it, it, before I go to that, back in 2014, uh, Premier Blaine Higgs was the finance minister, and I had discussions with him. I was talking to him, and he was saying, these tax agreements aren't right. We need to get rid of them. And I'm like, why? Why would you do that? It makes no sense. Oh, no other province in the country has it. And, and I'm like, no, but they share their revenues with their First Nations, their, their natural resource revenues, and you don't. So anyway, a week before they dropped the writ in the province, to, to for the election because it was it was the David Allward uh, government they dropped the writ and I'm like why are you doing this and I even told Higgs I said you're going to lose this election but yet you just put in the notice to terminate the agreements so of course the liberal government got in and didn't terminate we renegotiated better agreements so right from way back uh you know seven years ago he's been wanting to get rid of these Agreement. So it's not, I don't know if it's necessarily retaliatory because he's always wanted to get rid of them because he doesn't, I don't think he likes history because he even said, oh, forget about the past. Let's move forward. Like that's, you know, Aboriginal 101. What not to say to an Aboriginal person, forget about the past. Who the heck says that, you know, except the premier of this province. And uh, so anyway, he, um, he's always, he's always made it known to me that he doesn't like the agreements because he, he, he thinks it's taking money away from New Brunswickers. Well, are we not all New Brunswickers here? We all live in this province and this money stays here. We take that money and we reinvest. We re, and that, like, it doesn't make any sense. Give it to Irving, sure, and he's gonna send that off to the Bahamas, but give it back to First Nations and they'll hire people here and, and they'll use, they'll, they'll reinvest here in the province. So, um, it just so happened that he lost a carbon tax case because we took him to court because we said you're wrong. And of course we won. He waited the appeal period. And then we announced our land claim on a Monday and on the Tuesday, he gives the notice. So it looks pretty uh, retaliatory, but I don't believe so. I think he's had this in his mind all along. It might've it might have just irked him a bit, but um, he did gr congratulate me on it. But uh, that's enough money. Matawas can't have any more. That's it. You're done. You're too super wealthy, is what he's saying. <laughs> and I know we're kind of so just kind of on the tax revenue side. Um, can you provide kind of like some examples on what that, you know, that tax revenue does for the First Nation communities? And, you know, you know, how does that uh, does that tax? How does that tax revenue 
reinvest to economic development or is there any other services that that tax revenue helps uh, provide services to all the First Nation communities? So, I mean, I, I can't really speak for what other First Nations do with their particular uh, revenue that they um, that they collect, but Madawaska has reinvested. So if, if you know where the Grey Rock Power Center is, you see um, just the infrastructure, just the infrastructure, like putting in the roads and, and blasting costs us $13 million. Um, and we have to build buildings. And so we invest quite a bit back into economic development, but we also, um, have raised the standard of living to our members in our community immensely. Uh, we, we provide annual funding for housing repairs. Um, we do a lot of infrastructure. Uh, we provide, education is a major one. We, pro, we help our students, any student who wants to go to post-secondary, we provide them with uh, a living allowance and all the subsidies necessary to succeed. And, and so we, we push a lot into that. We also give out a lot of money for extracurricular activities for our primary and secondary students. And we're talking in the millions uh, there. We also provide a lot more uh, health benefits than what the Health Canada um, uh, non-insured health benefits would provide. We go above and beyond. Um, so we do quite a bit of uh, standard of living uh, increase in our community. But also, like I said, infrastructure, education, housing, um, economic development, we throw a lot of money back into it, into those particular uh, um, areas to, 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 to actually raise the standard of living of our community. Thank you. I will, uh, I will encourage everyone, uh, if anyone else has any questions, uh, please don't hesitate to ask. Um, you know, if there's anything that you would like to have any kind of knowledge on, uh, you know, this is kind of the forum for it. So I will uh, check and see if there's any other hands up or anything. Just one more question. <clears throat> it's about education this time in general. I'm not sure who's going to answer this question, Stanley. Maybe you are, or maybe maybe Chief Patricia as well. Is <clears throat> There's a lot of support for the young, for the youth to go to school, and that's awesome. Is there support for existing businesses to uh, deepen their own technical knowledge or skills or educate, to upgrade their own business skills? Um, well, within our community, uh, we we provide a lot of incentives for entrepreneurs um, who who are um, interested in you know building up. Uh, a business plan or anything like that, but we all like. Not only do we help because there's a lot of funding out there uh, for a lot for entrepreneurs that we help to uh, to sort of direct them to. But uh, depending on whether they open up on reserve here, um, that's we don't provide education uh, with respect to that. But but I mean, if a, a person wants to go into business that, and go to school, absolutely. I mean, we provide. Uh, I, even pay for trainings, the short short term trainings that uh, that is doesn't normally pay, and we provide for that as well. And just to add to that, uh, Deborah, um, kind of what we do at Jedi is we have a we have our Jedi Business Incubator Program, our Jedi Business Accelerator Program, and then we also do a lot of um, uh, we do other entrepreneurship capacity development as well, as long as we. We have our Jedi Aboriginal Development Fund that helps with, uh, you know, supplementing uh, the cost of business plans, marketing plans, uh, et cetera. I noticed that Kim had her hand up, so I'll pass it over to Kim. Hi, everyone. I'm sorry, I, I can't, I don't know how to turn my camera on for some reason. It's not showing up here, um, but um, I missed a little bit of your the beginning I apologize for that I couldn't I couldn't log on <laughs> so I was having technical difficulties today I wish I would have heard your whole uh, uh, presentation uh, Chief Bernard um, my question is um, in regards to what is currently going on in the in the province and um, it, it seems that there's you know like you know in in the the year you know or the the outcome of the uh, truth and reconciliation and 
the calls to action, it's amazing to me how uh, this province doesn't seem to be uh, considering those calls to action. And I know that coming up next month is National or uh, Indigenous History Month, as well as National in, uh, Indigenous Day. Um, and I'm just wondering, is there any type of campaign, a communications campaign uh, that is being considered, uh, you know, just putting our history out there, um, you know, educating the province, because there's very little known about uh, our history here. Uh, most of the people in the province are not aware of our history, let alone our treaties uh, and how they are, um, you know, international treaties, not just, you know, made between provinces, they're, you know, they're international. Um, and I'm just wondering, is there any type of a, a campaign that's, that is being considered, you know, communication wise, just to put that information out there. And I don't even know if it's possible to shame this government, um, but if you can, you know, maybe talk to the uh, opposition to the green parties you know get as many on board because of course they're all going to side with you at this point because uh, you know they can't really make any promises but they can you know put the heat on a little bit and you know is there any way just to respectfully do a campaign to make this government look really bad yeah you, you know it's we don't really have to do a major campaign to make them look bad. I think they're doing very good on, on their own um, that way. Uh, we just have to say a few facts. And But um, but is there any campaign? Well, I know the University, uh, the University of Moncton here in Edmonston, they are uh, focusing on um, Indigenous History Month and they'll be doing lots of presentations and they've reached out to us uh, as the local community to, and, and so they will be working. I don't know what the other universities are doing. Is the province doing it? Well, I don't know because we're really not talking to the province or they're not talking to us because, um, and the perfect example of this was when they did cancel those tax agreements. And I, I'm sure most people know this, but it had to be the most insulting and, and one chief, uh, commented on it as if he was slapped in the back of the head by the principal because what happened was the province decides to terminate give notice to terminate these agreements so we we get a an email at nine o'clock in the morning oh you need to be on a conference call with the finance minister in two hours and they don't say what what it's for or nothing at 11 o'clock meanwhile I get a call from a media guy uh, you know, saying, oh, we have a, there's going to be a media um, conference with the premier and the minister of indigenous affairs. Do you know what it's about? Like, uh, no. <laughs> so the premier himself and the um, one quarter aboriginal affairs minister, because she's got three other jobs, because that's how important aboriginals are to this province that he's only allocated one quarter of a person. And so they go in front of the media, do a huge presentation as to why they're in issuing these taxation, these cancellations, a bunch of room, like two rooms, I think down at one of the big hotels down in Fredericton. And the media has an hour to ask questions. Then, so all the chiefs get onto a conference call at 11 with the, on a conference call, not a video call with the minister of finance, where he reads a little statement and says, um, uh, this is notice that the taxations you're hereby given notice that they're going to be canceled and I'm not taking any questions hangs up not like no chance to ask any questions nothing so this is the epitome of the relationship that first nations have with this province the premier and the aboriginal affairs minister to chicken to meet face to face with the chiefs and to give them the notice instead they meet face to face with the media hoping to gain support probably from the public. And then we we pretty much got hung up on by the finance minister. So if I if I can't explain a relationship, I mean, that's like, yeah, might as well broke up with us over text. Seriously, because that's mm -hmm. what it feels like. Yeah, yeah very disrespectful reaction. Uh, it was yeah. unbelievable. So, so honestly, is there a campaign to make them look bad? They just have to keep doing stuff and 
That's it. Well, it'll, it'll it, and it's going to happen because what's ne- what's really happening now is not only are we not having a relationship, and not only is it deteriorating, but it's becoming uncooperative. We're we're only now finding ourselves going to court after court after court to resolve any particular issue, and that doesn't that doesn't bode well for anybody. Nobody wants to pay the cut. The, the court fees. And I'm sure New Brunswickers in general aren't happy with him defending clearly, clearly negotiable things in, in court. I agree. Thank you for that. Thank you. I'm, Sorry, I'm, I'm really passionate about that. So, but that's just the way I talk to <laughs> Keep up the good work. You're doing a great job. <laughs> Thank you. We do have one more question in the chat box, Chief, um, from Rory, um, and he says that he his question relates um, to skills development and capacity building. What areas of skills development or capacity building do you see most advan- advantageous for the future of your community? Well, you know, uh, that's, a, that's a tough question. It's a good question um, because I have a lot of uh, members and people that come to me and say, well, what should I do? What, where, like, what area should I go in? What, where should I sort of direct my career or my skills? And it's like, honestly, the, the, and this is, this isn't something that everybody can do, but you got to do something you love. You got to have passion for your job. Um, so skills development is find out what you like and focus on how that can make you happy. Because if you're a happy person, you could be making all kinds of money and be unhappy. So it's really about finding something that you really enjoy doing and that's worth working for. Um, and that's that's the big thing. Like, I mean, y- you know, if you're gonna work for Irving and do all the labor and he makes all the money, well, that's not that's not real rewarding. It's not fun. There's nothing about that. There's something about you know, doing stuff that you love. And in in our community, people ask me that. And I say, well, you know, do you like politics? You know, start studying about politics. Do you, I mean, are you, are you a hands-on person? You know, get into the trades. So in, and, and in any case, what I'm saying is you can do anything you want. If you, if you, you know, you really put your mind to it, it's just what, what is it you need? What, what's in the need? And that I, I can't really, I can't really sort of, say but uh but yeah we we do anybody who wants training you can get it asking for direction is is um it's a soul searching kind of question that i I don't know if i would be able to answer to anybody but yeah yeah they they can only answer that themselves i guess i don't know if i answered the question correctly but (laughs) thank you chief um i have one quick question um you know with the aboriginal title claim you know it's he said that it's going to take you know decades to to um probably you know come to a conclusion now has there been uh, talks of you know when i'm going to say when we do win because <laughs> i'm hopeful um <laughs> what the plans will be for the communities um uh, in uh, management of this of the lands like is Will it be um, divided equally through the through the communities? Will it be governed, say, by Willistic Nation in New Brunswick? What is the bigger picture in, in how that is going to be managed? That's an excellent question. And I don't think we would be able to answer that. I mean, the leaders that are here right now may not be the same leaders mm-hmm. in 10 or 20 years. And, the, and there may be um, a need for a different kind of approach. So it's really, I think, a, a bit premature. All I can tell you is that um, the six holistic way uh, communities in New Brunswick are really at, you know, their peak of, of um, unity well, maybe not their peak, but are, are way, way better off than we used to be. And, you know, sad to say, but uh, sometimes common enemy can unite people. <laughs> and it doesn't seem to be uh, that that's a hard thing for us. Not that the province is our enemy, um, because we want to work with the province. We we want to, um, to get along, but we want recognition and we don't want to be uh, treated like children or cheated, sitting there with our hands out. Give us it's that's that old sort of uh, adage, like, you know, teach me to fish. Don't give me a fish, teach me to fish. And, and that's really, that's, that's the bottom line. As communities, we have the potential to be extremely self-sufficient. We have the potential to tell the federal government and the provincial government, 
just let us let us earn our own way here. Let us do what's best for us. And but we need you, we need that recognition. And if the province isn't going to give it to us, well, we happen to be on federal land. We need the federal government to step up and give us and give us that support to assert our own jurisdiction. It's in the constitution of this country. So whether you're you, you know you believe it or not, the constitution of Canada says that we have the right to self determination. We have that right. And drip as well. And that's all we need. And just recognize it and let us do it. But, you know, they just want to put spokes in our wheels because we'll become super wealthy. <laughs> right. Thank you for that, Chief. Yeah. Now, um, we're drawing close to our um, end time. So I just want to encourage anyone to, if they have any questions, to please um, um, ask them now. Um, we will be breaking here before our next session. Uh, and just, I know that um, people have been making comments in the chat box, so please feel free to read those. I know there's some great comments from um, Sean Sunius of um, the FCC and some comments from other participants, but um, any, any other questions, please feel free to do so now. Hi, it's uh, Sean Sunias. Uh, sorry, I uh, just made that comment in the, uh, in the chat there around how we engage our, our young people uh, in, into kind of reacquainting and reestablishing our connection and, and with the land and really how to monetize it. Because, you know, out, out in Saskatchewan, Alberta, you know, some of the Western provinces where TLE started to take place in 1992, we still have First Nations that, you know, they're leasing that land out to uh, the folks they bought it from, which is a great relationship. It gave them cash flow to kind of begin other processes and gain some business acumen, but now they're kind of shifting and saying, hey, we're in resource construction software, we're exporting stuff internationally, but we have all this in front of us and we still haven't really um, determined what our approach is. And uh, certainly we see, uh, you know, the agriculture sector that uh, is, is looking towards indigenous, much like the resource sector did 10, 20 years ago, looking for labor, right? They, they're asking a great question, but it's the lowest one on, on that rung in terms of uh, reconciliation and, and developing those relationships. So just want to get your thoughts on, on some of those challenges or how you may have uh, addressed that or, or seen some examples there, Chief. Um, and so you're talking about getting back to the land and, and, and things of that nature. Yeah. And, and that's like New Brunswick is, um, if, and I can only speak for the Willistigui, right? I can't speak for the Mi'kmaq um, on the, the Eastern coast of, the, of New Brunswick or in, on, in PEI or Nova Scotia, but, but um, you know, we are a river people. We, we migrated up and down the river and from the St. Lawrence all the way down to the Bay of Fundy. And, and that's who we are. Like, we are the river. So, uh, you know, a lot of our communities, and if you look to see where the location of our communities are, we are scattered along, along the river within our territory, um, not necessarily by our own design. Some uh, Madawaska is, the oldest uh, um, Maliseet community and w one of the only ones that's still in existence. There was Maductic and Ukbek, and Ukbek but uh, they were removed. So Maductic moved to Woodstock and uh, Ekpok, sorry, is, was part of Kingsclear. So they, 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 you know, the fact that over time and, re and remembering that we in the Atlantic provinces were colonized first, um, it, it puts us back so much farther than when you go out west to the other communities, a lot of them are a little more remote. Um, and, and so it, it makes for a different sort of lifestyle. I, I mean, our lifestyle was extremely disrupted by colonization because, uh, and one of the, when I did the land claim, one of the major, I, I, one of my, my first independent study was about how the provincial government rewarded those Indians that decided to become farmers. They were, they were, you know, praising them and giving them land and, and, and trying to get them to get their communities and their families to stop this migratory hunting and fishing lifestyle that we, we used to live. So, so Unfortunately, in today's modern times, we just can't really do that. And we're actually not even allowed to hunt on, on Irving leased land. 
it's crown land leased to Irving, but we can't exercise our rights there, which makes it really hard to to tell uh, people to go back to the, you know, to go back to the to go back to the land or traditional ways. Because right now I have a camp on crown lease land. So, you know, you can buy a camp on a, a leased camp. So I bought the land. I bought the camp because a guy built it and I paid the, the, the tax and the lease. And then I said, no, I'm not paying anymore. So I talked <laughs> to the to the uh, crown, uh, the, the crown lands director. And, and I told him, I said, look, you're asking me to pay taxes and to pay a lease on crown land that I actually have a right to be on by treaty and Aboriginal right. Yeah, well, you know, that's, you know, he said, we, you'll have to do that. I said, well, I'm not. I said, I'm not going to pay my taxes. And I'm not paying the lease. I find it extremely insulting. So he said, well, you're going to, we're going to send you like past due notices. And I said, that's fine. I have a folder. I'll put them in the folder. And I said, I'd like to see what you're going to do. Like, please try and evict me, please. I'm welcoming that. I want you to do that, but I'm not paying the taxes and I'm not paying the lease. And it's been three years and I, I, I get a notice every month. I put it in the file, but I'm not paying it. And I want them to take me to court, but they don't, they won't. They're not gonna set a precedent, right? So, but they'll leave me be. 